Here he is, ready to fire the cosmic trigger, Mr. Robert Anton Wilson. I used to get billed as a philosopher and stand-up comic but my legs are bothering me more than the recent years, so now I'm a philosopher and sit-down comic, the best I can do. Uh, I don't know how the hell I can follow that last act. <laughs> I do not have a wall of vaginas. I don't even have a single vagina. I do have a willy, however, which means that I might become Pope someday. <clears throat> You know, every, every church I know anything about has got some women clergy critters. I avoid the term clergy persons because it's redolent of human chauvinism. So I say clergy critters and congress critters and so on. Uh, but almost everybody has got women clergy critters except the Catholic Church. And uh, that drag queen in the Vatican, just a few weeks ago once again reiterated a woman cannot be a priest in the Catholic Church. Uh, he didn't quite explain it but it all comes down to a woman, uh, the priest symbolizes Christ and you can't symbolize Christ unless you got a willy. Which means that the most important thing about Jesus Christ was that he had a willy. Many, many people think the most important thing about Jesus, those who admire him, I think the most important thing about Jesus was that he taught a philosophy of love and forgiveness. A lot of other people taught that before him, like Buddha, for instance. Uh, those who don't like Jesus so much point out he was the one who invented eternal damnation. You would find a word about that throughout the Old Testament. Nowhere do they threaten anybody with eternal damnation. Jesus went around threatening everybody with eternal damnation which means that for 2,000 years, children have had nightmares, night anxieties. It's probably fucked up more heads than any other single doctrine. But if you're going to symbolize Jesus according to, according to the Pope, you've got to have a willy. Uh, I've done a lot of meditating on this. Why do you need a willy? What, was, that, was that really the most important thing about Yeshua ben Yosef, to give him his correct name? You know, in Hebrew, his name was Yeshua ben Yosef. He's only called Jesus Christ by those illiterate shitheads who do the uh, televangel hours. Uh, Yeshua ben Yosef uh, <clears throat> probably had a willy as far as we know, although he said some have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake and maybe he was one of them. He does look rather effeminate in most portraits, but the portraits are all based on imagination. Anybody going around with a pink dress on and long hair looks a little bit effeminate, you've got to admit. But uh, I think that's what Freud called the return of the repressed. Catholicism is the most patristic religion in the Western world, although it hardly begins to compare with Islam in that respect. But anyway, I think the real reason you need a willy to be a Catholic priest is that the Catholic Church has many roots in the early pagan fertility cults. For instance, they borrowed Christmas from the cult of Mithra. They borrowed Easter from a, another pagan spring celebration. Halloween, even the Jehovah's Witnesses know that's a pagan holiday. Uh, and the dead and resurrected God, that's an old pagan theme. Osiris, Dionysus, Adonis. Uh, there, are tw there are dozens and dozens of dead and resurrected gods, all representing the death of the crops in the winter and their rebirth in the spring. And part of these early fertility religions was what anthropologists call phallus worship or willy worship, to put it in the vernacular. And uh, this seems to have been connected with the idea the greater the size of the willy, the greater the divinity in dwelling. Which is why if you seriously get into archaeology and ancient history, you will find Osiris, Dionysus, Priapus, Pan, most of the great fertility, male fertility gods do not have normal sized willies. They have three times as much as the average actual male human. Uh, they sort of look like a, 
uh, chest of drawers with the middle drawer pulled all the way out. And you'll fi you don't find this in popular books on ancient history because they're afraid of shocking the pants off the public. But if you really study the scholarly works, you'll find dozens of do hundreds of these ithyphallic divinities, as they're called. I think the Catholic Church, when they took so much paganism over and incorporated, they also took the doctrine that uh, the willy is especially sacred, and the bigger the willy, the more sacred it is. And that's why a woman can't be a Catholic priest. Any women in the audience who are brokenhearted by that, let me remind you that being a Catholic priest is a pretty dreary business. Outside of Walter Boys, you're not supposed to mess around with anyone else. <laughs> but at least this explains why the selection of the Pope is wrapped in so much secrecy. You know, all the cardinals retire into a room, the doors are locked. Nobody knows what goes on in there. Eventually smoke comes out and that means they've made their decision. Nobody knows how they make their decision. I figure it's sort of like the way they cast the lead in a porn movie. They all lay it down on the table and somebody goes around with a ruler. The bigger the willy, the better, better equipped you are to be the head of a church, which is based on the idea that the willy makes you superior to anybody who doesn't have a willy. And if that isn't the basis of Catholic teaching, I don't know what the hell is. This, uh, this is one of my many heresies. I try to think logically, and the result of that is most people think I'm a satirist. But consider the, consider the difference between Federal Reserve notes and counterfeit money. I have been meditating on that ever since I read Ezra Pound's cantos at the age of 18, as many cantos as they were then. He wrote more later. But studying Pound's cantos got me very much involved in this question of why do Federal Reserve notes pass as money? Well, as far as I can, I've read all sorts of explanations. I, I followed this argument through the pages of economic journals, books, and so on. I never found a reasonable explanation except the one I made up myself. If you or I or the mafia print a whole bunch of money in our basement, no matter how good it looks, it's not real money. You know why? Because we don't have a magic wand. When the Federal Reserve prints money, they wave a magic, prints paper, they wave a magic wand over it and it becomes money. If you don't have the magic wand, it's a counterfeit. And I have yet to see any book on economics that gives like an explanation that makes as much sense as that one. Just like I've never found a book on theology explaining why women can't be Catholic priests that makes as much sense as the one I thought up myself. Maybe I should get the new title, Defender of Part of the Faith. If you can believe that the willy is really central to holiness, and that the Federal Reserve really has a magic wand and every other money is not real money, then the world begins to make sense. If you can't believe either of those doctrines, it looks like a large part of the world is run by raving lunatics or out white charlatans. And it's hard to... <clears throat> <clears throat> I forget what the national debt is right now. It doubled, it tripled during the Reagan years and it's been increasing even faster ever since. Not million, 5.6 trillion. And, and you know, uh, when they started raising it dramatically under the reign of Roosevelt II, the, all the liberal intellectuals kept telling us, don't worry about it, we only owe the money to ourselves. I was raised on that line of bullshit. We only owe the money to ourselves. That's not true. We owe the national debt to the Federal Reserve, which is a private bank of whom the owners are unknown according to the law establishing the Federal Reserve. You can't find out who owns the Federal Reserve because under the law that's never to be revealed. The president may know, but even the president doesn't know. Actually, he only knows half of them. The president appoints half of them and they appoint the other half. We don't have any idea, and that's only the board of directors. We don't have any idea who owns the stock in the Federal Reserve. We owe $5.6 trillion to these bastards and we don't even know who they are. But that, don't worry, don't worry, they have a magic wand and their money is real money and we've got to pay the interest. If anybody else printed all that money, it would be a count. If, if a bunch of anarchists got together and printed currency and distributed it without interest, that would be counterfeiting. The Federal Reserve is perfectly legal and can collect interest on the paper they print because they have a magic wand which turns paper into money. Now this, because of saying things like this, I've got a reputation as an atheist. I, uh, some people think I don't believe the willy has any special magic and I don't really believe in the magic wand that the Federal Reserve has. Actually, although I have my doubts on that subject, 
I am not an atheist. I used to be an atheist, but I had to give up. I discovered I didn't have anything to say during a blowjob. Uh, you know, <clears throat> oh, I mean, oh, random chance, random chance, random chance. That, 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 does, that just does not convey the gravity of the situation. <clears throat> Those of you who have read my book, Cosmic Trigger, know, ah, a lot of you. Oh, that's nice. Hey, that's very flattering. You all know what happened on July 23rd, 1973. That was the day I achieved contact with an extraterrestrial from Sirius or started hallucinating like mad, depending on which way you want to look at it. I have varied between both theories over the years. But I just found out recently, since I'm a student of synchronicity, this one really struck me. July 23rd, 1973 was also the birthday of Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> well, that is important. I regard her as one of the most important figures in American political history because she kept the United States Congress arguing for over a year about whether having a blowjob in the White House was cause for impeachment. Apparently they thought that George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, John Quincy Adams, <coughs> Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, William Henry Harrison, and uh, so on and so on, Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, none of them ever had a blowjob in the White House. Uh, now, I don't know whether I believe that or not, but I'm just enough afraid it might be true that if anybody nominates me for president, I want you to know right away I won't run. The idea of eight years without a blowjob is just, it's just absolutely too much. I just can't face the thought. So I do not want to be president. So even if the Republicans did not succeed in getting Clinton impeached, at least they persuaded a lot of us we don't want to be president. <clears throat> Pardon me, I needed a little water. This is water, it's not vodka, I wouldn't fool you. This is the only, I think this is the only country in the world where the major legislative body could be tied up for over a year and debating about whether a blowjob is cause for impeachment or not. I can't imagine it happening in Amsterdam and France and England. I can't imagine it, I can't even imagine it happening in Ireland. I can't imagine it happening, certainly, but then again, this is the only country in the world which uh, has, uh, um, uh, well, I, it's not the only country, it's the leading country in the world that imprisoning its own citizens. We have more people in prison in uh, total than any other country in the world. We have more than all of Europe put together. And this is true both in terms of total numbers and percentages, and they're building more prisons faster all the time. I think this is absolute nonsense. All this money and time, like what they should do is build a wall around the whole country and announce we're all under arrest. Well, why do it slice by slice, step by step? It's obviously what they're aiming at is to put us all under arrest, so why don't they do it in one step? You know, I used to read a lot of Kafka. I, I, I was convinced Kafka was the most brilliant, insightful analyst of the modern world of all, of all contemporary. I like Joyce better, but Kafka seemed to me to get to the essence of the modern condition. But even Kafka, in his wildest pages, Never imagine something like the piss police. Now, we live in a country which is based on two documents, the Declaration of Independence, which is not a matter of law, but it's supposed to be the theory on which our country is based, and the Constitution, which is supposed to be the basis of our laws. And nowhere in either of those is there any suggestion that we're going to found a government that will go around peer prying into people's bladders to see what they've been doing lately. I can't imagine this happening in any other country. <clears throat> but, lest I sound too cynical, I want to point out that I'm taking great interest in the current election campaign for the first time in an aeon or so. Yeah. 
Well, I, I, went, I went for a couple of decades without voting at all. And then after I moved to California, where they have a lot of interesting propositions on the ballot, I figured it's worth voting just to vote for some of the good propositions and vote against the bad ones. And then I voted for Proposition 215, which legalized marijuana for cancer and AIDS patients and other people. Yeah, well, that goes to show what good it does to vote. The majority of the people in California voted for that proposition. And as soon as Clinton heard about it, he said, well, I'm paraphrasing, but his general attitude was, fuck you, you think this is a democracy? You can't make laws, we make the laws. And they're still throwing people in jail in California for using marijuana to treat their cancers. And these are dying people, people in terrible agony are dying, and the government is dragging them in their wheelchairs into court. And I do not exaggerate, they have actually dragged people in wheelchairs into court and sentenced them. And this, and this is because we live in a free democratic society where the people make the laws, except when the establishment doesn't like it. And then the attitude is, fuck you and your laws, we make our own laws. Well, as Jack McCoy said on Law and Order a couple of weeks ago, one of, <laughs> that's my favorite TV show. Don't ask me why. Uh, it, it just, uh, the number of surprise, I'm a writer myself, as you, some of you may have heard. Uh, there's a term that writers use, a paper dragon. A paper dragon is a surprise that doesn't make any sense. It only happens because the writer decided he wanted a surprise ending, or she wanted a surprise ending. On um, law and order, the surprise endings all make sense. They're all things that seem perfectly normal in police investigations and uh, legal trials, and so on. These things all could happen. And I guess that's what I like about it. They continually surprise me, but not in ways that seem absurd, in ways that seem totally logical. But that's a digression. Jack McCoy recently lost a case against a millionaire family, one of whom had committed a murder. And they all got together and made up fake alibis and testified to one another. He got a team of lawyers, about 12 of them, to McCoy and his associate all alone. And of course, they won. And the end of the show, uh, McCoy's associate, Miss Carmichael, whose first name I never get clear, she's only been on the show for a few months. She, Abby, that's right, thank you, Abby Carmichael. She said, well, there are two laws, one for the rich and one for the poor. And Jack McCoy looks off into space and says, what law for the rich? Is there any law that controls the rich? I, I can't, I don't think there is. Well, there was a famous case here in New York about 60 years ago, more or less. A guy named Harry Thor, who was rich from having money. He was filthy, stinking rich. He was fucking rich. He was one of the richest people in the country. And he was not only jealous of the possibility his wife might ball another man after marrying him, he was insanely jealous of the possibility she might have done it before marrying him. And then he found some evidence she had an affair with her before she married him. Before she was married to this guy, she had an affair with an architect named Sanford White. And I presume there's a lot of New Yorkers here. I don't think you all came from out of town. Uh, you'll see Sanford White's, White's work at Madison Square Garden. He designed that. You'll also see it in Greenwich Village. He designed the Washington Square Arch. He designed a lot of other great things around New York. Well, Harry Thor found out that Sanford's wife and his wife had been having an affair before he even met her, not only before he married her, before he even met her. And Harry Thor was the kind of insane, possessive person who couldn't stand the thought that his wife fucked somebody else even before she even saw him. And he brooded over it and brooded and brooded, and one day he walked into the restaurant on Madison Square Garden and he shot Harry Thor, he shot Stanford White in plain sight of about 100 or 200 witnesses. And guess how much prison time he served? Zero, zilch. There is no law for the rich. And then there's uh, DeLorean, the DEA, not my favorite government organization, but the DEA got him on videotape with uh, three kilos of cocaine in his lap negotiating the price. Guess how much time DeLorean served? Zero, zilch. Richard Nixon was accused of more goddamn crimes than about the, 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 any mafia family you can name. How much time did he serve? Zilch. Spiro Agnew was actually forced to resign and had to pay a fine, but guess how much prison time he served? Zilch. Do you believe, does anybody in the whole goddamn country believe a black kid from the ghetto with a pile, with a box of cocaine in his lap on television, on video, 
would have gotten zilch in prison, he would have got 20 to life or something like that. There is no law for the rich. As a matter of fact, if you've ever read, how many people here have ever read Guillaume Battista Vico, just out of curiosity? Guillaume Battista, ah, there is one. Well, Guillaume Battista Vico, whom I have only read in English because I don't know enough Italian to read him in the original, and that may give me a warped view because as somebody said you can't translate Vico into English. English is an honest language. Uh, Vico wrote in, in the 1720s and 30s when the Inquisition was still very active. He was accused of heresy several times, but he was never brought before the Inquisition, but he knew they were watching him. So he wrote in a very tricky style, but the major message that seems to come through in Vico's new science is that civilization was, was founded by a bunch of sociopaths who figured out a way to enslave other people and they took an oath among themselves, we will never give up, we will never relent, we will hold these bastards in slavery forever. And that is, that is the main theme of Vico's new science. I think that's the major theme that Joyce used in Finnegan's Wake. And everybody writes about Vico's cycle theory, which takes up about 20 pages at the end of the book and is not the most important message in the book. And it's not the message that would interest Joyce. Joyce, as an Irishman born under British dominion, had plenty of chance to study imperialism, oppression, injustice at first hand, being on the receiving end of it. Uh, and Joyce's day, he was born in Ireland, he was a subject of the British Empire, so was everybody else born in Ireland. In Finnegan's Wake, Joyce makes numerous parallels between the Irish, the Hindus, the Chinese, and the uh, Negroes, uh, slaves in the United States, every oppressed group, he unites them all in one cosmic vision of all the people who've been screwed throughout history and the people who have been screwing them all along. And I think that's the major thing Joyce got out of Vico. Sorry, I'm getting serious for a while, but Joyce and Vico are among my preoccupations. My wife used to say that whatever they tell me to talk about when I get in front of an audience, what I actually talk about is what's been going through my head in the last week. And I guess uh, Vico and Joyce have been on my mind a lot in the last week because I'm writing a book about Vico and Joyce. It's also about Ezra Pound and Ernest Fanalosa and Buckminster Fuller and Internet. And it's called The Tale of the Tribe. And don't go running out to try to find it because I haven't finished it yet, much less got it published. <clears throat> what are Yates? Sorry, that's an Alistair Crowley joke and not a very good one, not one of Crowley's better jokes. What if excess of love bewildered them until they died? I write it out in verse, McDonough and McBride, Connolly and Pierce, now and for time to be, wherever the green is worn, a changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. Okay, that's, that's, that's about all the Yates I've memorized. No, I know another, I could do another bit of Yates. Um, a statesman is an easy man, he tells his lies by rote. A journalist invents his lies and rams them down your throat. So stay at home and drink your beer and let the neighbors vote. I always thought that was pretty cynical until after I voted for 215 and I found out that voting for propositions does no more good than voting for candidates. If they don't like the way you vote, they just ignore it. <clears throat> But I'm, I'm really enjoying this election because it looks like the candidates are going to be Bush and Gore. Uh, everybody in the country knows by now, it's been so widely publicized, that Bush has been lying for years about the extent and duration of his cocaine use. We don't know if he stopped yesterday or he hasn't stopped yet. We don't know when he stopped. He changes his story every time a new witness appears with more evidence that he did it more recently than he admitted yesterday. The same thing with Gore's marijuana use. He keeps changing his story on that and more and more witnesses are popping up with more testimony that he didn't stop when the last one he said. He stopped a little bit later if he did stop at all. So for this is the, I think this is the first election in which the whole public will know what I have suspected all my life, that the only choice we're offered is between two lying bastards. Now me and my friends, most of the people I know have known that at least since the 60s, some of us have known, knew it even before that. But this is the first election which everybody who still takes the time off from 
more profitable occupations like blowjobs, art, music, and actually goes out to the polls to vote. Everybody, all of these idiots will know they're choosing between two lying bastards. I want to see how they're going to choose between the two lying bastards when they know that's the only choice they got is two lying bastards. I think this should be a really hilarious election, especially since I'm sure Bush and Gore have already worked out a deal that neither one of them will mention the other's drug habits in any of the debates. But the thing is, everybody will know they're avoiding this subject and all the media will all be asking questions about it, even the corporate media, because the story is too big now to conceal anymore. And of course, it will be all over Internet. Internet is my favorite invention in world history. I like it even better than the wheel. <laughs> Internet is, is the only place where we have what Thomas Jefferson thought this country should have, only it's not just this country, it's international. Absolute freedom of expression. Anybody who has a very small amount of money can put up their own website, publish their own views. There's no gatekeeper. Every, uh, uh, when they named Gutenberg, when A&E named Gutenberg the man of the millennium, I thought, boy, are they lost. They're back in the dark ages. Gutenberg was very important at one time, but books still had gatekeepers. In the first place, you couldn't get a book published unless the publisher thought they might make some money out of it. In the second place, you couldn't get it circulated unless you lived in a country with less censorship than others. And even in the countries with the least censorship, in the 20th century, any modern scholar, critic, commentator on literature will agree wherever they place them. And among the 10 top books of the century, they would certainly include Joyce's Ulysses and D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover. Both of them were banned in this country for a long, uh, Joyce for a decade, Lawrence for about three decades. And this, uh, in spite of all my criticism, this is a comparatively free country for books. In the Arab world, getting a book published is much harder there. Without the government suppressing it, it's much harder than here. And there's always been gatekeepers. There is no gatekeeper on internet. Janet Reno, Diane Feinstein, Orrin Hatch, and a lot of other reactionaries are trying to figure out a way to install a gatekeeper on internet. And you know what? They can't do it. Internet is international. If they, if they, if they close, the, if they find everybody who has a link to a website referring to drugs, which they're trying to do, then everybody will just put the links into places in other countries that don't refer to drugs, but have links to sites that refer to drugs. I mean, they can't control the whole world. This is the great joy and paradox and liberation that I see in internet. The only way internet can ever be effectively censored is by a world government. And the people who are most keen on censorship are the ones who are most terrified of a world government. They are the people who think every helicopter they see is the UN scouting out where their troops are going to come in when they invade us. You hear them on the radio, especially in the West where I live. There are these helicopters, uh, black helicopters that fly around, and most people that I know believe it's the DEA looking for large marijuana patches. Um, some people believe it's the Satanists looking for cattle to mutilate. But an awful lot of people believe it's the UN scouting out the past their invading troops will take when they finally take over this country completely. Uh, I mean, the people who most want censorship are the ones who are most opposed to world government. Only world government can ever effectively censor the internet. Ergo, we're never going to have any censorship of the internet. And I, that, to me, is the greatest liberation in human history. I, I lost faith in the corporate media around the same time I lost faith in politics. I guess that was, that was long before the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War just solidified my position. Uh, like Buckminster Fuller, he used to get letters from people who had heard his lectures or read his books and said, run for president, run for president, we need you. And Fuller got so many of those letters he made out of formats that he sent out to all of them, in which he explained he was engaged in important work. And he couldn't take off eight years to waste his time in the White House. What the hell can you do in the White House that will really make a difference compared to the difference that Internet made or that Buckminster Fuller's technological innovations have made or Claude Shannon's master's dissertation in 1940 at MIT, which proved that you can use Boolean algebra to analyze electrical circuits and you can use electrical circuits to solve problems in Boolean algebra. I don't suppose one internet user out of 10,000 ever heard of that paper, but internet wouldn't exist if Claude Shannon hadn't written that thesis. 
Claude Shannon and Buckminster Fuller did things much more revolutionary than anybody in the White House. And besides, if you do get yourself locked up in that place, you've got to worry all the time. And you, any, any time you have a blowjob, kind of star spies might find out about it. <laughs> but I, I like Kenneth Starr in one way. He has shown the legal way to publish pornography. All you got... <laughs> It could even get it published by the United States Government Printing Office. <clears throat> the reason I drink so much water when I'm on stage is that before, the last hour before I go on, I smoke more than usual, so I end up getting a dry mouth. And the reason I smoke more before I go on is because I get stage fright. And I'm not ashamed to admit that because I read an interview with Laurence Olivier, who was approaching 80, and he confessed he still got stage fright. It seems this is one of those conditions for which there is no cure. Anybody who performs in public, whether they're doing a humorous philosophical rap like me or playing Hamlet, whatever they're doing, there comes a point before they're due to go on and they suddenly get this agonizing doubt. Supposing I get up there and I can't remember a damn thing I was supposed to say. Supposing I just stand there mute looking like a total asshole. What am I going to... What do I do? Suppose I can't think of a single thing to say. Well, you see, that disappears as soon as I get up here. I can think of hundreds of things to say. I already explained the Catholic Church and the Federal Reserve <coughs> and Ken Starr. You know, the funniest thing about <coughs> the Monica Lewinsky case is <clears throat> I don't give a damn how many blowjobs Clinton had or where he had them or what anybody else is doing either. The same thing with our uh, gay citizens. Jerry Falwell has a show which is devoted mostly to persuading people to go out and beat up gay people. I have never been, I have never, even in my youngest years when I was most ignorant, it never seemed to me that it was my concern what other people were doing with their sex lives. That's their business, not mine. And yet we live in a country in which a large part of the population thinks they've got to pass more and more laws to cover more, to, to forbid more and more types of sexual behavior, to govern more and more people. Well, America is the place that goes in for superlatives. As Bucky Fuller said, to quote my favorite philosopher again, if he was a philosopher, he was more of a scientist. Fuller had a principle about never writing about anything he couldn't prove with a working model, so I guess that means he was never a philosopher. He just sounds like a philosopher at times, but he was a scientist all the time. Uh, Bucky Fuller said that uh, the United States of America has devoted most of its energy, its scientific intelligence, its uh, budget, uh, it's put oh, everything it could into one single project for the last uh, 50 years or so, and that is how to deliver more and more explosive power over longer and longer distances and shorter and shorter times to kill more and more poor people. Now this is a hell of a thing to spend most of the country's resources on, but if they keep at it, you know, they're getting closer, eventually they'll reach the point where we can kill everybody in one nanosecond. And then America will have achieved its historical function, apparently. Then the question is, is somebody going to press the button or are we going to say, well, now we got it, now what do we do next for an encore? which reminds me of my position up here following the wall of vaginas. I'm standing back there, I'm thinking, what the hell do I do for an encore to that? <clears throat> I, I would like to switch now and talk about the book which has impressed me most in the last year, a book called Saharasia. How many people here have ever heard of Saharasia? Nobody. Good, I can enlighten you all. Saharasia was a master's no, it was a PhD dissertation uh, for the University of Kansas by James Nemeo, a ge geographical, geological scientist, whose first, his master's dissertation was testing Wilhelm Reich's cloud buster. And they approved that, believe it or not, although doing research on anything of Reich's is generally forbidden. But the University of Kansas, the committee figured he would refute Reich. When his results confirmed Reich, they told him he couldn't do his PhD on Reich, too. They were afraid he'd confirm even more of Reich. You see, uh, there's many aspects to the Reich case, but I like to... One simple way of looking at it is, in 1952, Wilhelm Reich was the first one to announce that no peacetime uses of nuclear energy would do the human race any goddamn good at all. Reich predicted wherever we used nuclear energy, there'd be a sharp rise in cancers. And this disturbed a lot of people. I think it disturbed the United States government especially 
because in 1957 they broke up, they broke into his laboratory, smashed all of his scientific equipment with axes, took all of his books, magazines, articles, publications, everything he had ever written and burned them in an incinerator and then they threw the bastard's ass in jail where he died, to quote E.E. E. Cummings. And with that scientific, with that degree of scientific refutation, everybody lost interest in Wilhelm Reich. I mean, you can't argue with an argue, you can't argue with that kind of scientific proof. The Inquisition settled the Galileo question that way, well, at least in Italy, for at least a few hundred years. But uh, Reich has always haunted me. I, I grew up on anti-Nazi movies, and to me, the, the uh, one of the things they said this was before when I was very young, before the annihilation camps were opened and we learned the full horror. One of the things they stressed in the World War II anti-Nazi movies was the horrible crime against civilization, against humanity, against intellect, in burning books. And I took a very strong imprint on that. I have a very strong bias against people who burn books, magazines, artworks of any sort, scientific papers of any kind. And then, 12 years after the war is over, here's the United States government burning books. What the hell? Who won that war? And then we, then we found out about all these radiation experiments the United States has been doing on people. Where the hell was Joseph Mengele in all those missing years? Was he advising the United States government on scientific research? Anyway, uh, De Mayo's uh, PhD dissertation, which grew into the book Saharasia, is about the origins of what he calls armored patrism. Uh, I wrote about this a little bit in my book Ishtar Rising. Uh, I read Rat Ray Taylor's Sex and History, in which Rat Ray Taylor listed about 12 variables which seem to go together in a cluster. Uh, and these 12 variables are um, either women have equal status with men or men have superior status, either sex is accepted and openly enjoyed or sex is forbidden, repressed and uh, either there's a father god or a mother goddess, and I forget the rest of them. Um, <clears throat> and I got Rat Ray Taylor called them matrist and patrist. I called them anal patrist and oral matrist, so I could tie Rat Ray Taylor's work in with Freud's. Anybody here read Ishtar Rising? You familiar with any of this? Yeah. Well, what De Mayo did, he took 36 variables. Rat Ray Taylor only had 12. De Mayo took 36 variables, and the two biggest uh, ethnographic atlases ever published. He ran the whole business through computers, and he checked all the cultures of the world for these 36 variables. And he found out we have more than five patrist variables. There's a 95% probability you're gonna have the other 31. And wherever you have more than five of the matrist variables, there's a 95% probability you're gonna have all the others. Among the variables he included, which, I, which Rat Ray Taylor didn't include and I didn't include, is genital mutilation. You go, he's got, this book is full of maps, uh, which makes it easier to grasp the data. Any place where you find genital mutilation, you're going to find men are superior to women. You're going to find that society is very warlike. You're going to find children are frequently beaten and otherwise abused. You're going to find there's a father god. You're going to find there's a very strict code of morality. You're going to find women are killed for premarital sex. And he's got a whole bunch of the, uh, he's got 36 of these variables. And they all go together. Uh, there are some societies that are mixed, but by and large, most societies on this planet are predominantly patrist or predominantly matrist. Uh, where you find women have a low status, you will find circumcision, sub you'll find Either the boys get their wangs chopped or sub-incised, or the girls get their clitorises removed, or they get their outer labia removed, or they get the outer labia and the inner labia removed, or in some places they get the whole works. The clitoris is cut off, the labia, inner and outer, are both removed, and then the whole thing is sewed up. That's called infibulation. When you find a society like that, you always find they're very warlike. Men have a much higher status than women. Women live basically uh, slave lives. Uh, harems are common, polygamy is common, <clears throat> which means that women are having sex with men they don't really dig, but they're being forced into it. Uh, and uh, insult sensitivity is very high. People get killed for insulting one another. And uh, wherever you find uh, the absence of genital mutilation, you generally find men and women are equal. 
there's hardly any wars. Sometimes there are no wars at all. Rape is unknown, usually, like in the Trobian Islands. The, the Zuni Indians can only remember one murder in their whole history. That's, and they only remember that because they're an oral culture. Oral cultures remember things longer than literate cultures. The one murder in Zuni history happened 300 years ago, and the Zunis are still ashamed of it and still don't know why it happened. And the Patras culture of the United States as a whole, I think we have one murder every seven minutes, if I remember the statistics correctly. And I think we have one rape every three minutes. And of course, we have plenty of genital mutilation, although it's, it's only practiced on women by people of Arabian descent. It's practiced on the whole male population by doctors who assure us the procedure is scientific and necessary. No scientific justification to for uh, circumcision has ever been published that makes any sense whatsoever. But the cure, the thing that the Mayo stresses is the doctors who do the circumcisions hear the baby screaming in agony and it doesn't register on them. Why? Because they have patrist armored values. They've shut down their own emotions so they can't recognize anybody else's emotions. And infant screaming is just one of the side effects of normal procedure. Just like slapping them on the backside right after they're born. Isn't that a great way to join the human race? <clears throat> now, this patrist mattress, armored, unarmored, or anal, oral, whichever way you want to classify these types of societies, I think it basically goes back to uh, what I wrote about in Prometheus Rising. Uh, right after birth is a period of acute imprint vulnerability, which Conrad Lorenz won the Nobel Prize for his writings on imprint vulnerability. There are periods of imprint vulnerability throughout life. There are especially sensitive ones right after birth. Now, you're either going to imprint human beings I'm combining Timothy Leary and Eric Byrne here, if anybody wants to know where my terminology comes from. You're either going to print human beings as warm fuzzies, loving, nurturing, supporting critters that you can trust and love and who love you, or you're going to imprint them as cold pricklies, hostile, vicious, dangerous characters that you want to have as little to do with as possible. Obviously, the, ma the maximum cold prickly imprint means a totally autistic child or else one that grows up to be a criminal sociopath. Those with a warm, fuzzy imprint are the ones who grow up to be friendly, generous, outgoing, full of humor, nice people in general, the kind of people you wish we, we, all your neighbors were. I think, the, uh, to quote Leary again, uh, the essence of evolutionary intelligence is to find the proper habitat. The thing to do is to live where you're surrounded by warm fuzzies instead of where you're surrounded by cold pricklies. And, uh, it's quite obvious, you can tell almost, uh, just in a few minutes conversation, you can tell whether the person you're talking to has imprinted humans as warm fuzzies or as cold pricklies. And if they have imprinted human beings as cold pricklies, you will find that they grew up in a culture or a subculture in which genital mutilation probably exists. If it doesn't, other forms of brutality to children exist. But uh, beating children is common, but usually you do find some kind of genital mutilation. The slap in the backside right after birth greets them so they know right away they're surrounded by cold pricklies. Who the hell would hit a helpless infant at a time like that when they're just born? How can these fucking doctors do it? Well, as Wilhelm Reich said, nobody can recognize an emotion in others unless they've experienced it themselves. Most doctors in this patristic and armored anal society cannot recognize the sadistic things they're doing because they don't recognize the pain expressed by the people who suffer it because they have armored themselves so much they don't have any emotions left at all. Isn't this an extreme, paranoid, crazy view? No wonder they burned Reich's books. They're probably going to burn de Mayo's book as soon as they find it. Maybe I shouldn't be talking about it. Maybe I'm just hastening the day when the government comes and burns that book, too. <clears throat> One of the fascinating things about Saharasia is he, he uses 36 variables and compares uh, 1,200 different cultures. This is probably the biggest cross-cultural study ever done in one book. And he, he documents all of the correlations very, very carefully. As a matter of fact, the book is rather boring because it's so goddamn carefully documented and he, all the evidence is laid out before you because he he knows how much hostility this is going to arise, so he's protected himself as much as any scientific heretic can by 
piling on the documentation. We've got 1,200 cultures, and they all follow the general laws he lays down, let him not he lays down the laws he deduced by studying these 1,200 cultures. And all of these, all of the armored patristic cultures all originated within the deserts of North Africa, the Middle East, or Asia, or clearly can be shown to have been influenced by invaders from that area. Now, that area was not always a desert. Before 4000 BCE, that area was a lush, verdant jungle, just like the rest of, uh, like, like the central part of Africa. Around 4000 BC up to 3500 BC and after, but especially in that 500 year period, the vegetation died, that whole, the whole place turned into deserts. There must have been massive starvation. There was a message fleeing from there. And now one of the effects of starvation is not only that people die, but that the survivors suffer brain damage. This has been demonstrated repeatedly in studies. If you, if you go through a long period of malnutrition, especially when, this is especially true of infants. An infant that doesn't get fed properly during its first year is very, very likely to suffer some kind of permanent brain damage. This is not anti-LSD propaganda. This has been well documented about what happens if kids aren't fed properly. Of course, the best food for children, for, for newborns, is mother's milk, which again, we notice most patrist cultures try to, uh, try to evade one way or another. Throughout the United States today, they still, the majority of people still give the children an artificial formula in a bottle instead of giving them the mother's breast. That interferes with the mother-child bonding right away just like separating the child from the mother right after birth, which is done in most hospitals. Now, there are people who deliver children in the natural, wholesome way, in which the child is not banged around right after birth and is put on the mother's breast and they form a loving bond right away. This is the midwife movement, and the United States government is waging war on that too, <clears throat> which is part of the whole patristic uh, armored structure of our culture. My wife, Arlen, used to say, talking of getting back to the piss police, she used to say, if a drug can be proven to be cheap, effective, and non-monopolizable, it will also be illegal. And check that out for yourself. See if, you, see if you can think of any drug that's cheap, you can grow it in your backyard, it's effective, it really works, and nobody can monopolize it. It's always illegal. The only legal drugs in the society are the ones that are monopolized, high-priced, and generally damn near toxic like AZT, for instance, which kills more of the patients than it helps, according to a hell of a lot of statistical studies. The number of people who die from prescription drugs every year runs into the hundreds of thousands. The number of people who die from vitamin C every year, so far, all the data collected is zero. Nobody has ever died from... So guess what the government is trying to ban next? Vitamin C. They, uh, they can't ban it. They've tried to ban it. That's failed. Now they've got a new program. They're trying to persuade us to that it should be controlled, so you've got to go to a doctor and get a prescription for vitamin C. That's still endangering the profession because if you take more, the more vitamin C you get, do you take, the less likely you are to develop any major illness. And if you do develop a major illness, the more you're likely you are to throw it off. If you don't throw it off, the more likely you are to live a long time after getting the major illness. There's plenty of statistics to back this up. You'll find them in the writings of Linus Pauling, who the only man who ever won the Nobel Prize twice. And what is, what is, so the government wants to, uh, so if they can't stop people from taking vitamin C, they want you at least to go to a doctor and get a prescription so the doctor gets a cut on the profit so you can't get the low price you got before you had it. I mean, you go to a doctor, it's going to cost you over $100 anywhere in the country for an office visit, right? So you've got to pay $100 before you can even go and buy the goddamn vitamin C. Well, some people still believe in the AMA. Some people still believe in the government, the lying bastards. And so... <laughs> Some people believe the piss police are necessary, and some people believe the Federal Reserve really does have a magic wand which turns their paper into money and everybody else's paper is just shit. By the way, if Andy Warhol, you know, Andy used to keep a pantry full of Campbell soup cans, and if he liked you, he'd autograph one, and you had a genuine, a genuine authentic Warhol of your very own. I think that's, I think that's a beautiful... Uh, it's really breaking down the false barrier between art and life. What he should have done if he had lived longer, he would have thought of it as the Sue Campbell soup for selling cheap imitation Warhols. <clears throat> but if Andy Warhol found a dollar on the sidewalk and put a frame around it and called it found art, 
I don't know what it would be worth, but let's say at minimum a hundred thousand, maybe a million. I don't know what Warhols are going for now. Now, how does it change from being worth one dollar to one million dollars just because Warhol put a frame around it? Well, because he's got the, he's got the stat, status in the art community. But would it make any difference at all whether the dollar he found was printed by the Federal Reserve or by the Mafia or by you and me in our basements? I don't know, would it? I don't know. If I, if money is the Schrodinger's cat of economics. <clears throat> then there was Timothy Leary. <clears throat> I mean, how much time I got? Timothy Leary did a lot of research with psilocybin and LSD and he supervised research done by others at Harvard. In one experiment, uh, they took a bunch of convicts who were due for release soon. They gave them psilocybin with music and mystical readings and a whole bunch of re-imprinting techniques. And Leary's criteria for this experiment was, how, where are the bodies in space-time one year after release from prison? Uh, throughout the United States, the average answer is 95% of them are back in prison after one year. That's the, the receipt of a rate one is 95% on average, lower in some states than others, but it averages out to 95%. So Leary said, we're not going to talk about neuroses, psychoses, sociopathic personality, any of that jargon. Where are the bodies in space-time? One year after Leary's research, 95% of his convicts were still out on the outside. They had jobs, they were doing something or other. They were not back in prison. Well, this threatened the whole goddamn police state and the whole goddamn prison business, so of course they stopped the research. Meanwhile, Leary did another study, or he supervised a study by uh, Andrew Weil, in which a bunch of theology students were given LSD on Good Friday in a church. Some of them got LSD, some of them got an inactive, no, an active placebo, which made their skin tingle a little, so they thought they got something or other. And then the, the, the reports of what they experienced were compared by another group of theology students according to their definition of mystic experience. And it turned out that uh, more than two-thirds of the ones who got the psilocybin had mystical experiences and none of the others had mystical experiences at all, thereby proving that a chemical can induce a mystical experience which should not surprise anybody with a scientific education because all of us psychological, so, uh, psycho somatic, visionary, etc. experiences are mediated by the chemistry of the brain. What you're thinking or feeling at any given moment depends on what's got, what chemicals are running through your brain. Mashed potatoes are just as psychedelic as, mesh, as LSD, except in a different way. If you've ever gone from a, a, an omnivorous diet to a vegetarian diet, you'll notice your whole world, your whole reality tunnel changed. If you've ever gone from a vegetarian diet back to an omnivorous diet, your reality tunnel changes again. I've been through both of those experiences and I, I speak from experience. Everything that gets into your brain affects your reality tunnel, your worldview, or your belief system, which I abbreviate BS. The, the, two, the, the, the three major things I've been trying to teach in all of my books is never believe fully in anybody else's BS. I don't care if it's Roger Nish, the Pope, L. Ron Hubbard, Al Gore, George Bush, or I don't care who it is. Don't, don't, don't swallow all their belief system totally. Don't, don't accept all of their bullshit, all their BS. The second rule is like unto the first. Don't believe totally in your own BS, which means that, as Bucky Fuller said, the universe consists of non-simultaneously apprehended events. Non-simultaneously. Universe consists of non-simultaneously apprehended events, which means any belief system or reality tunnel you've got right now is going to have to be revised and updated as you continue to apprehend new events later in time, not simultaneously. This is the natural functioning of the human brain. It's the way children's brains perform before they're wrecked by the school system. It's the way the minds of all great scientists and artists work. But once you have a belief system, everything that comes in either gets ignored if it doesn't fit the belief system or it gets distorted enough so that it can fit into the belief system. You've got to be continually revising your map of the world or you'll lose more and more contact with reality. Anybody who has a belief system which covers the whole universe 
That would be the Roman Catholics, Orthodox Islam, the Scientologists, PSYCOP, the Marxists, the Objectivists, and most of the assholes you meet on the street. Uh, well, what, they, what has happened is their brain has stopped receiving new signals. Or to the extent that new signals do get in, they all have to be edited to fit into the belief system. If they don't fit the belief system, they get repressed one way or another, like the doctors can't hear the baby screaming while they circumcise them. Um, I lost track of where I was going with that thought. You know, I found a new way to get high and stay spaced out for hours on end and the government can't stop me. It's called senility. <laughs> the, 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 yeah, really. The, the, there, are four, there, are four, there are four major signs of this. One is increase of long-term memory. I can walk to the kitchen and on that walk, I can remember things that went on in kindergarten, including a fight I had with a kid named Billy Batson who had blonde hair. I remember the blonde hair as well as the name. I remember another fight I had with a kid named Alan Smith. I remember there was a girl in my class named Ursula Yard who had very black hair, but chiefly I remember her because the name Ursula Yard seemed like a character out of Dickens. I thought it was a wonderful name. And I can remember all those other things like that. Going, I can remember things happened when I was two years old. And the second effect of senility is that when I get to the kitchen, I can't remember what I was going there for. And I forget what the third one is. <laughs> and the fourth one is I don't give a fuck anymore. As you can see by the things I've been saying tonight. Actually, I, I've been saying daring, satirical, sarcastic, sardonic, and subversive, and dangerous things for a long time, but I'm, I'm getting much more uninhibited since my wife died. I suddenly realized if they throw me in jail, nobody's going to be hurt but me. And what the hell does it mean at my age? At my age, nobody's going to want to rape me. I'm not the, you know, they like young boys. So what does it mean if they throw me in jail? You know what it means? I get X number of years, let's say five. I get five years of free, uh, free lodging, free food, and free medical care. That's another of the wonderful things about this country that makes us unique. Every other country in the industrial world, and several countries in the not yet industrial world, Mexico, Costa Rica, quite a few of them, have national health plans in which everybody gets the medical attention they need, whether they can afford it or not. In this country, there are only two groups that are guaranteed medical attention, whether they can afford it or not. And they are the two professional criminal classes. That's the members of Congress and the people in our prisons. If you're in prison, you get all the medical care you need, whether you can pay for it, and the same thing in Congress. I don't know why the hell our society decided that only the nefarious felon should get free medical treatment and the rest of us can starve to death on the sidewalk outside the hospital without any treatment at all. But that's the kind of fucking crazy country we live in, isn't it? And while I'm fucking and fucking and all throwing around words like that, I suddenly remember George Carlin, one of my, he's my favorite philosopher. And uh, I, thought, I, I thought I would quote well, one of my favorite all-time lines from George Carlin. Why is it that all the women you see at anti-abortion rallies look like nobody would want to fuck them in the first place? I don't, I've noticed that for years, but it never came to consciousness until Carlin said it. <clears throat> By the way, Carlin not only has given countless hours of amusement and relief, he gives relief as well as amusement. There's a great relief in hearing somebody say on television the things that we're all thinking that we can never get into the mass media. Carlin has wormed his way in through years and years of building up his fan club to where HBO lets him on once a year and he can do his uncensored act just the way he does it on stage. And I really admire that. It took him years, it took him decades to get there, but now he can get up on television and say things like I just said. Uh, and that, that's a wonderful achievement. And uh, the other thing, uh, it's a great relief because we all suffer from a constant, not all of us, I mean just the people in this audience, I mean the people like us, our kind of people. We all suffer from this constant frustration that 99% of what we say can never be expressed in any of the major media. Carlin was a major relief. We could listen to him and say, by God, somebody actually said it and they didn't shoot him, they didn't hang him, they didn't cut his head off, they didn't throw him in boiling oil. There is some freedom of speech. Now with internet, we can all do it. We can't do it in a major media, but when you put up a website, you don't know how many people are going to look at it. Ten, a thousand, a million, twenty million, you never know. Put up a website, you can say any goddamn thing you want. You can call 
Uh, and when I revise, I've been doing this in my email for the last couple of weeks. When I, when I update my website, I'm going to put it in there too. I am going, I'm continually referring all through this year to the two leading candidates, if they, uh, if they turns out to be them, as the two lying bastards. I, I hope if I keep this on my website long enough, it'll get picked up. And if I, I got about 10 other lecture gigs this year, with which I'm going to use that. I hope eventually the whole country will get into the habit of referring to Gore and Bush as the two lying bastards. I think that'll be a great triumph for sanity and a victory over horseshit. Uh, and having been a member of the neo <laughs> I used to be a member of the neo-American church. Hmm? Oh, oh, that's what that means? Oh, he, he was making obscene gestures at me, and I, I thought he wanted me to go to bed with him, and I did you know, I, I, I'm, I, I <laughs> now he's telling me to wrap it up. Let's see, I did Sahara Asia, I, I did the AMA, or I did them in the eye, I did the Federal Reserve, I talked about the two lying bastards. What can I do to wrap all this up? Maybe. Oh, well... Well, well, you see, uh, De Selby is a character in a novel by Flann O'Brien, and I admired, it's a novel called, as a matter of fact, he's in two novels by Flann O'Brien, but the one I love the best is The Third Policeman. And I couldn't resist putting De Selby, he's only in the footnotes to that book. I put him in the footnotes to one of my novels. Then I started thinking, that's a tribute to uh, Flann O'Brien. If a movie director does that, it's called an homage. You can lift all you want from Hitchcock, and it's called an homage to Hitchcock. You can lift anything you want from Orson Welles, it's an homage to Orson Welles. But in the literary world, that idea hasn't gotten across so much. I suddenly got afraid I might hear from the Flann O'Brien's estate someday. Fortunately, that book went out of print, and De Selby disappeared from my writings. He has been replaced by somebody of my own creation who has something in similar with De Selby, but is uniquely himself. That's Professor Timothy F.X. Finnegan, of the Sir, Sir Miles Nagopoline, uh, Royal Sir Miles Nagopoline Astro Anomalistic Society in Dalkey, just south of Dublin. And uh, Professor Finnegan was the one who, by computer enhancement, proved that the face on Mars is Mo Howard, <laughs> which there, thereby shows that uh, Mo has had an influence on at least two planets. Since the Three Stooges went on television about 30 years ago, their old movies started getting reshown. Up to 30 light years away, Mo may be getting recognized more on more and more planets where there, where there are intelligent entities. Uh, Mo is the sort of the uh, synecdoche or epiphany or ideogram or... Uh, he, he is the central image of patristic values. Mo is responsible for the ideas that if somebody doesn't understand something quickly enough, hit them over the head and they'll understand then. <laughs> or, if, or if they don't do what you want them to do, stick your finger in their eye. Right? And he taught a lot of other lessons like that. Uh, he was also one of the funniest men who ever lived, I think. But uh, besides that, uh, Professor Finnegan founded the SICON, uh, the Committee for Surrealist Investigation of Claims of the Normal, which I, of which I am the American CEO. We are offering a million dollars to anybody who can produce a totally normal human being. Or a, t or, a total, or an average sunset, or a typical Beethoven symphony, or, or a, an average plane made of the month. Like we want something that's totally average in all, in all respects. It can't be found. It only exists in, abstra in mathematical abstraction. As Joyce said, the state is concentric, but the individual is eccentric. Nobody is quite the well-regulated robot our leaders want us to be. And I guess that leads up, we're not talking anymore about Professor Finnegan's great discoveries. I think I will close up with uh, my latest thoughts about the lying bastards. They are spying on us more and more, they're snooping on us more and more, they're stealing more and more of our property all the time. They don't even have to prove we're guilty of a crime. They just have to accuse us. They could take our houses, our cars, our boats, any damn thing we own, our computers, anything. Uh, and we're getting more and more recalcitrant, which means that makes them nervous, so they're spying on us more and more and worrying about us. I think the only solution to the American political problem is if the government goes somewhere else, finds a more docile and submissive people and governs them and leaves us the fuck alone. And thank you very much.